Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's nice to be back, back at Glenbrook, and thank you for having me as well. There's been um, a couple of big changes since I was here in June or July. Uh, the first is the temperature, obviously. It's gone from 20 up to barely above 2 degrees Celsius, but I've heard that there have been plenty of um, new people coming to the fellowship as well, which is great. Um, God moves people according to the different gifts and needs that we have in the church, and we're all equipped out spiritually. When someone becomes a Christian, not only are they saved from um, death and damnation, but God brings us into eternal life. He brings us into his kingdom. He, he gives us gifts, according to Ephesians and Romans and other passages in the New Testament. We've all got at least one spiritual gift, which isn't for our own benefit. It's for the benefit of the body of Christ, which is why we come together. It's why we come to serve one another. There are all the different ways and capacities that God gives us. So this morning, I'd like to speak from 1 Samuel chapter 12. So I'm going to give an overview. Thank you. So I'm going to give an overview of the background to this passage. A look at the events that happened in this passage. And then from that, I'd like to look at the actions of God, the actions of Samuel, and the actions of the people of Israel, the three um, characters, so to speak, in this passage and what we can learn from them. So I'll read from 1 Samuel 12, and then I'll pray. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice in all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. Now here is the king walking before you, but I am old and grey, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. They said, the people of Israel, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, he is witness. Then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So now, Take your stand, that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did for you and your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God. So he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jeroboam and Bedam and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around, so that you lived in security. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him, and listen to his voice, and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you, as it was against your fathers. Even now, take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Then all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, so that we may not die 
For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit nor deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king shall be swept away. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is eternal. We thank you, Lord, that as we heard, your word is authoritative. And no matter what attacks, Lord, the world and the devil may throw against your word, your word will stand. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and true. And we ask that you would speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the background to the passage we've just read in 1 Samuel 12 is that in the Old Testament times, before Christ and before the church, God revealed himself to humanity through the nation of Israel, through the patriarchs and through the prophets. God is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. His character remains the same. He is always faithful. He is always the one who has authority over all people and all things and all of nature. But God has progressively revealed himself to mankind in stages. And in the Old Testament times, he did so through the people of Israel, who we've just read about. God saved them from slavery in Egypt to make a people for himself. Not because the Israelites have done anything to earn God's favor, but because God is a loving God who wants to redeem humanity from its sin. And he wanted to bless Israel and use them to reach out to the other nations around them. So God brings them through Moses and Aaron out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and into the promised land of Israel. And unlike all the other nations around Israel, Israel at this time had no king. It was a confederation of different tribes, the 12 tribes that were connected under their uh, rule under God. So as Samuel says in this passage, even though they had no earthly king, God was their king. The Israelites didn't need to have a strong standing army or a powerful uh, king with total authority over everything because God was their king. Before the Israelites entered the promised land, God had made a covenant with his people. In, and we read this in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Because God is a righteous and loving and faithful God, he must um, bless what is good, but punish what is evil. And so the nation of Israel entered a covenant with God. And in essence, God laid down his law in the Old Testament to explain his character. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of these commands are not arbitrary. They are a reflection of the goodness and the character of God. And as such, as we are made in the image of God, we are called to behave and think and act like God. And God's law revealed that standard. That was what the Israelites were commanded to live up to. And God said, if you will obey my laws, I will bless you. I will make sure your crops are not just reliable, but your, your barns, your vats will be overflowing. When the nations around you come to invade and attack, I will defeat them, God says, if you will follow me. It's not a case that the Israelites sat on the backside and did nothing. They were farmers. They were craftsmen. They were traders. And when the enemy came to invade and to steal and destroy, they were warriors as well. But the point was this. God would be the one that would enable them to do all of that work. It says in Deuteronomy, it's God that enables you to grow your crops. It's God that enables you to work and have wealth. The nation of Israel was to depend on God as their king, not an earthly king that they could see, but God himself through faith. Faith is a motif that runs throughout the Bible. 
right from the start in Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. We live, according to the Bible, by faith alone. We are saved from our sin and judgment by faith alone in Christ. Christ was there at the beginning. He's there at the end. And we will look upon this with um, some of the, the characters of God and also the behavior of Samuel as well. So even though God is faithful, we as people are not faithful, are we? We have a sin nature. We are prone to lash out against God's law and rebel against him. We do that as Christians. We do that as churches as well. The nation of Israel was no different. And in this instance, even though God had delivered them time and time again, when the Israelites sinned against God and forgot him, when they went after other gods, when they went after their own way of worshiping or their own lifestyle, um, the curses of the covenant came into action because God has to discipline his people. We see that today as well. You can read the book of, um, he read Hebrews chapter 12, read other parts of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 5. God's discipline towards his people, towards us, still exists today because he is a loving father. He cannot let us go on in sin. But God is still faithful in the midst of that. When Israel had sinned time and time again, God delivered them over and over again. He was always the faithful king that would come to save his people when they repented. But the Israelites had, had enough. They weren't happy with just an invisible God as their king. They wanted an earthly king, and they demanded it in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, they had a natural grievance, a, an understandable grievance. Samuel was um, the prophet and also the judge of Israel. So while Israel had no king, it had a judge who would be there to act as a governor. He would take law cases. He would go from city to city to see that things were running well and that justice was being served. But as um, Samuel is the judge, he was also the prophet. He would teach people the word of God. It's not enough to give people laws and commands. What's required is a change of heart, and that comes through the word of God. Samuel understood this, and Samuel prayed for the people as well. Despite all of this goodness from Samuel, and ultimately that was the goodness of God working through Samuel, the people of Israel said, we don't have enough. We want a king like everyone else around us. And so this is the circumstance here. In 1 Samuel 8, God says to Samuel, the people have asked for a king. I'll give them one. They may have asked for the wrong reasons and at the wrong time, but nonetheless, God said, I'll give them a king. And he gave him King Saul. And so going to 1 Samuel 12, the people have come together again as part of a covenant renewal. They already have King Saul. Samuel has already explained to them what the problems are with asking a king for themselves. But here they are to renew the covenant. And Samuel is about to step back from his role as judge. He's going into retirement. He's an old man. He understands that God is now going to work through King Saul. And Samuel, as an obedient servant of God, is willing to lay down his authority and step back. But also as an obedient servant of God, He's also going to speak a hard truth to the people of Israel. And so what we see here then in verses one to six is that Samuel is setting the scene by saying, Israel, I'm standing before you now. Tell me, have I done you any wrong? Have I stolen your goods? Have I taken too many taxes? Have I taken bribes? Come, if anyone has a case against you, bring it before the whole people. Samuel was a transparent leader. He was not afraid of scrutiny. So he comes and challenges the people. And the people we read in verse 4, it says, no, you've not stolen from us. You've been a fair judge. The kings of the Middle East were known to be takers. They would take the best of the goods of the land. They would take the best of the young men for their, their soldiers. They would take the best of the young women for perfume makers, for other jobs as well in the palaces. The king would always take from his people, but Samuel was not like that. He was a giver. He gave leadership. He gave counsel. He prayed for the people. He taught them. He was with them. He never took from them. Samuel was reflecting the character of God. God is the one who gives to us. Everything we have comes from God. And Samuel was reflecting that. We should do the same thing. So the people said, yep, Samuel, you're right. Um, you're innocent, 
we have nothing against you. And there Samuel goes on in the next verses from 6 to 12. Samuel talks about a bit of the history of Israel. One of the commands we have in the Bible is to remember what God has done for us. How often as Christians do we spend time in prayer, looking on the past week, the past day, but also every so often all of our life to say, thank you, Lord. I can see now, after all these years that you were there in that difficult situation, I thank you, Lord, that uh, when I couldn't do this thing that needed to be done, you provided for me. The nation of Israel was the same. They were required to remember what God had done for them. They'd forgotten. So Samuel reminds them. He reminds them that their ancestors have rebelled time and time again, that they suffered as a consequence, but God was faithful to restore them. And then from verse 12 onwards, Samuel says, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Samuel is saying, you've, already, you've rejected the authority of God. It wasn't enough for you that you had a God who has promised, though you can't see God, though you can't hear him, you can't touch him like an earthly king where you go to his palace and see him in all his splendor. You rejected God because you couldn't do all of those things despite the blessings he'd given you. And then it says in verse 13, Now, therefore, here is the king you have chosen, whom you have asked for, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. That's King Saul. And what do we know from the book of Samuel? Saul started out well. He started out as a humble man. He started out as a man of action. When... Um, I think it was the Ammonites, or one of the eastern tribes invaded Israel and threatened to uh, gouge out the eye of every man and cut off the fingers to stop them from fighting. Saul, when he heard this, he was angered. He mobilized all the people of Israel into an army and attacked, and God gave him the victory. That was what Saul was commanded to do as king, and Saul obeyed. Saul started out as a good king. Even though the people had asked for the king at the wrong time, and for the wrong reasons, God was gracious to give them a king that had the potential to do well for Israel, to serve as God would serve if he were there in person. But Saul didn't stay that way. Saul began to um, reject God in different ways. Saul did not fully obey God, and so when God commanded Saul to do certain things to destroy certain enemies of Israel. Saul did not do it thoroughly. He wanted to keep some of the best of the goods and the loot for himself and for the people. In other cases, Saul was actually led by the people. When God commanded Saul to destroy the Amalekites, he said, destroy everything, destroy all of the goods as well. The Amalekites had been such a corrupt and evil culture that when the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness to Israel, the Amalekites didn't try to, to um, accommodate the Israelites or let them through to say the refugees, they need a place. They attacked the Israelites. And not only did they attack the Israelites, they went to the end of the line, the end of the convoy, so to speak, where all the old and the sick and the weak people were and massacred all of these people. Can you imagine a, an army going around destroying people in care homes, in hospitals, in nurseries and schools. That happens, by the way. That does happen in countries. There are countries like Nigeria, the North, where you have where you have organizations like Boko Haram and hardline Islamists and in other places that will destroy the weak and the vulnerable. And that was true of the Amalekites. Think about ISIS, think about all the worst organizations that exist today. The Amalekites were like that as a culture. So God says, destroy them. They are a threat. They've been given time to repent, but they've not done that. But Saul leaves some of them alive. Saul leaves the goods behind. And he says, oh, it was the people. Um, it was the people that, that, that preserved some of the goods and all, some of the animals for themselves. It may have been that Saul decided he wanted them. It may have been that the people decided for themselves. And Saul, as a weak leader, went along with the plan. Because of that, it was a very serious sin, and God said, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, Saul. But Saul carried on as king. He still rebelled, and it brought trouble to Israel. 
It brought defeat. It brought disaster. When we try to go for something that God has not or does not want to give us, if we grab it for ourselves, even if in and of itself is a good thing, if it's not right for us at this time, God may decide, okay, if you insist, you have that. And then it brings the consequences on ourselves. And that's what Israel went through. But nonetheless, Samuel had to reinforce this point. He reads now from verse 16 onwards, even now take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? This was around the summertime in Israel. Summer in the Middle East very rarely rains. So in the summertime, it says, is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Then all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. But we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. So Samuel, to prove that this was not his own words, to prove that he wasn't just um, a jilted leader who's been rejected, he says, I am going to ask God to bring a miraculous sign to demonstrate that what I have said to you is not from me, but it's from God himself. And so God brings this storm that almost destroys the crops. And, you know, we have an abundance of food in the West. We generally don't worry about going hungry. That was not a luxury that people had back then in Israel. A storm could have destroyed the wheat harvest and then they'd have no food. They would have starved. That's why they said, pray to God that we may not die. Samuel has asked God to give them such a sign that it's clear that God is angry with what they've done. They wanted an earthly king to give them earthly blessings in an earthly way. But no earthly king can stand against nature because God is the God of nature. We depend on him, even though we don't see God. We may not hear him audibly. We can't touch his cloak. We cannot always understand where God is working in our circumstances. Nonetheless, we depend on God for everything. And God is at work behind the scenes. But once in a while, God does reveal himself, doesn't he? He does reveal himself in a way where we think, wow, that was God speaking, especially if it's a warning for where we're going wrong. But praise God, look at what the people did in verse 19. Then all the people said to Samuel, pray for your service that the Lord your God, so that we may not die, for you have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. The people confessed their sin. They acknowledged that what they did was wrong. And in fact, they go further, they said, um, we have added to all of our sins this evil. They're not just being half-hearted in their confession. They're saying, we have a long history of, of defying God, and we've made it worse by asking for a king. Please don't kill us. This is where the gospel message comes in today. We as individuals, all of us, have sinned against God, who is our maker, he is our provider, and he is our king, whether we realize it or not. But when we cry to God and say, Lord, I have sinned, forgive me. And if we do that on the basis of what Jesus, his son, the king of kings did, we ask for forgiveness based on the sacrifice that Christ gave on the cross, paying for our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to make us his people. And then from verses 20 to 25, Samuel says, do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And then he goes on to say, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. And this is where I come to the end of my message to summarize the actions of God, Samuel, and the people of Israel and what we can learn from them. So we've learned that God is the one who provides for us physically. He is the one who is sovereign over all of nature. He is the one who delivers us from our enemies. And ultimately, he is the one who forgives our sin. God was not going to destroy the people of Israel at that time, despite their continued rebellion, because God is a faithful God. Samuel says that himself in this passage. 
It's for God's own name's sake that he will be faithful to Israel, not because of what Israel deserves, but because of who God is. And in the New Testament times today, now I don't believe that we have replaced Israel. I believe that just as God is faithful to us, he is still faithful to the people of Israel. That will come about in time. We will see, according to the scriptures, that God will work in the Jewish people to bring them back to the King of Kings, the Messiah. But that's not quite happening. It is happening, but it's not been fulfilled just yet. That will come. But for us today, we are not under the Mosaic Deuteronomic covenant of blessings and curses. But nonetheless, as the children of God, as his people, he does bless us as we walk with him in faith. He disciplines us as we go against him and decide that we want a different sort of king. We want to become our own authority. We want to follow other people other than Jesus and his example. But God is faithful. He says, even though you have done greatly, I'm going to stop this storm. I'm going to forgive you. From now on, if you obey me, I will bless you and I will bless your king as well. The consequences of the people's sin were that Saul was not removed immediately. They suffered under Saul. They suffered invasion. They suffered disaster. Thousands were killed by the Philistines towards the end of Saul's reign. The consequences of our sin and rebellion don't always go away. But God is still faithful in the midst of that. God brought up King David. And David, even though he was not perfect, he was um, characterized as a faithful king. And he brought blessing to Israel. He defeated the Philistines. Once and for all, he subdued the Philistines. David was a fair and just ruler who brought God's law and God's blessings. And all the nations around them brought tribute to David. To some degree, they recognized the God of Israel because the Israelites began to follow God again. We as Christians, we do not receive material blessings because we obey God. That's not the covenant we're under. In fact, God can bring hardship. We heard about the lady in Poland who had to suffer um, the bombings of the Germans during the Second World War. But God does bless us spiritually. As long as we fulfill his role for us in his kingdom, God will give us the deliverance we need for that. He will provide the food and the shelter and the water that we need. Not always the luxury, far from it, but God provides us what we need and he gives us something better. He gives us a place in his kingdom. He gives us the spiritual blessings, the strength to go on, joy in the midst of hard circumstances. And that should be a witness to other people around us to say, there's something different about this person. And that difference is that Christ is in us and we are in Christ and the Holy Spirit energizes us. And then look at Samuel as well. He was a righteous man. He says here, moreover, as far from me, from, in verse 23, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Even though the people have rejected Samuel, Samuel was still praying for the people. There are family members, there are friends, there are relatives, there are other people in our lives who are a bit of a curse, aren't they? To varying degrees and in various ways. But God says that we should remain faithful to them. We should pray for them, intercede for them. Why? Because we have an intercessor in Jesus, don't we? Just as the Israelites had the prophet Samuel to pray for them, Jesus prays for us at the right hand of the Father, and we should pray for other people as part of that, almost a chain of command, you could call it. We are to follow God's example, Christ's example, and Samuel did this. But he also says, but I will instruct you in the good and the right way. We depend on the teaching from the word of God to stay on the right path with God. Yes, we have been saved. Yes, our salvation is secure in Christ. But we are called to obedience, aren't we? We're called to serve him with all the different gifts and capacities that we've got, whether it's with the, um, what's it called, messy church, when you have the kids around, whether it's you know keeping the church maintained, whether it's witnessing to people, whether it's going to visit people in the hospital, all of these things are different ministries that God gives us. All of them. All of them are spiritual. All of them are a blessing to others. We depend on the teaching from the word of God, every single one of us, to stay faithful to God. But even when we don't do that, we suffer the consequences. God remains faithful to us. So confess your sin. Say to God, you're sorry. If there's any area in your life where you have, 
turned away from him or not trusted him. It's not too late. God says, I want you back. We read about the, the power of the, the, um, the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. The father ran to his son. He didn't say, oh, look who's back. Or, oh, look who's wasting my inheritance. He ran out to his son. He wanted his son to say, I'm sorry, dad. Please take me back. Give me, give me just the least of the jobs in my household. But God gave him so much more than that. So even though we as Christians can mess up our lives, can't we? All of us, I, there are consequences in my life that still to this day I have to carry because I have rebelled against God in the past. But even then, God is still faithful. He uses the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. And if we will obey his word, if we exercise faith by obeying his word, God will bring about blessings in his way and in his time. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, you were faithful to the people of Israel. We thank you, Lord, that you sent men like Samuel. Lord, we thank you that you had uh, faithful women like Hannah who would praise you, Lord, and cry out to you and bring blessing to other people. We thank you, Lord, that we can be, forgiven, we can be restored and we can be put to work in your kingdom. Would you lead us now, Father God? Would you remind us of your faithfulness and help us to remember what you've done for us and help us to move forward in you? In Jesus' name, amen.